forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of what? That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You know, as Christians, we have a whole lot to be grateful for. But the thing I am the most grateful for, of all the things as a Christian, I am grateful that I am forgiven. Forgiven. There are a few words as beautiful as that. Say it with me. I am forgiven. Your spouse may still be giving you the silent treatment. And your friend may still be holding a grudge. And you may still owe that person some money. Or, or maybe they owe you. But hallelujah, in Christ, I am forgiven. The three most beautiful words in all of Scripture. It is the, one of the most basic principles of Christianity but real forgiveness is reconciliation. Real forgiveness is one of the hardest things you will ever do in your life. And notice I said real forgiveness because there is such thing as fake forgiveness. Fake forgiveness. Fake forgiveness is when you say you forgive someone, but you bring it up every time you see that person. That's fake forgiveness. Fake forgiveness is when, is when you say, I'll forgive you, but you continue to make little cutting, jabbing remarks reminding the person of how they messed up. Fake forgiveness is rolling your eyes every time someone enters the room. None of you do that. Fake forgiveness is when your blood boils when, you, when that person opens their mouth. And yet as Christians, we have to do it. That's right, it's mandatory. Because how can heaven forgive you if you cannot forgive? When I think of forgiveness in the Bible, I think of one person. I think of Joseph. Joseph was beat up, thrown in a pit. He was sold into slavery, falsely accused of adultery with his boss's wife. He was unjustly thrown into prison. While in prison, he interprets the dream of the royal cup bearer. He tells a man, in three days, you're getting out of here. Just do me one favor. When you get out of here, I want you to tell uh, Pharaoh uh, so that he might get me out of this place. But the chief cup bearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so for two more years, Joseph is abandoned in prison. Now, the cupbearer was lucky that I was not Joseph. Because the moment I became vice pharaoh, first order of business, I want to see the royal cupbearer. <laughs> Bring him to me. <laughs> Catherine, I always know you're going to get a kick out of the jokes. Uh, look, but when you examine all of the tragedies of Joseph's life, friends, they can all be traced back to one, one thing. Or should I say ten? His brothers. You do know the hardest people to forgive are people in your own family. And that's because you can't ignore the person that you live with. It, it, it's much easier to forgive someone that you don't see much. In fact, we don't even really usually forgive those people. We just forget them. But the person that you're related to, the person that you, you, know, you sleep in the same bed as, the person you go to church with and the people you work with and live with, man, you got to forgive them, and it's the toughest thing you'll ever do. The people that you interact with on a daily basis. Notice, 
According to the Bible, Joseph's brothers hated him and could not speak peacefully to, of him. Uh, Genesis 37, 8, they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And, and, and then in verse, 30, uh, verse 11, chapter 37, it says, and his brothers were jealous of him. Anger, hate, jealousy is what Joseph's brothers felt towards him. Now, Joseph was not innocent either. Sometimes Joseph is painted as this perfect little kid. No. Joseph was a tattletale. Joseph was, 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 was probably spoiled. I mean, he was the only who got one who got the coat of many colors. Joseph, Joseph, uh, he, he, was, he was spoiled. He was a kiss-up. I have a feeling Joseph was incredibly annoying. Hey guys, I had another dream last night. Let me tell you about it. Keep it to yourself, buddy. I don't care about your dream. You guys all bowed down to me. But friends, nothing Joseph did warranted what Joseph got. Let's be honest, some of the people in our lives that we don't like, that we have not forgiven, are people that we get mad at, and, and we don't like them simply because they are very annoying. They get on our nerves, and so we treat them bad. Friends, nothing those people do warrants the way that we treat them. Forgiveness is hard. When someone hurts me, man, I suddenly get the gift of prophecy. I have visions of what I'm going to do to them when I get my hand on them. Joseph had 13 years to get creative with his visions. In prison, all he had was time to think about what he'd do. Every bowl of cold soup, uh, a slop he ate, every flea bite he got, every rat he killed, every second, hour, minute, day, the years, every moment were all reminders of what his brothers did to him. And yet greater the injustice, the more beautiful the forgiveness. You see, according to Romans... Romans 5, 6 through 8, Christ died for the ungodly. I should have heard a few more amens in that. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Basically, it's hard enough to die for people who love you. Jesus died for people who hated him. It's hard enough to forgive people that we like, let alone people we don't like. And yet God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, the Greek word there is, is enemies. Christ died for us. I like the way the message paraphrase puts it. It says, if, if that's not what it says. Let me read it to you. But God puts his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death. Here's the key point. While we were of no use whatsoever to him. Now often when we forgive people, it's because we still have some use for them. Think about it. We live with them. Or we, we got to go to a church with them. Or we work with them. And so basically we say, you know what, if I'm going to continue to enjoy church, if I'm going to be able to enjoy my life, if I'm going to be able to enjoy my marriage, if I'm going to be able to enjoy uh, work, then, then I better get forgiving them so that I can continue to enjoy my life. We forgive because we still get something out of the transaction. You see, there's still an asset. But according to Romans 5, 8, God forgave us when we were not an asset. We were only a li liability. We brought nothing to the table, and yet God still loved you enough to die for you. Luke 6, 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? That doesn't mean nothing. You don't get no points in heaven because you love someone that you like. But if you can love someone you don't like, heaven pays attention. For even sinners love those who love, who love them. When you're really been hurt, when you have real just cause to be upset, when you really have a reason to hold a resentment and you convert, forgive those people, that is real forgiveness. Forgiveness is not, uh, I forgave them, I just don't want to be around them anymore. That's not forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is not, I forgave them, but I'm not going to forget about it. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is not, I'm going to forgive them, but I'm just not going to let them forget it because I'm going to remind them every second. No, real forgiveness, according to Scripture, is reconciliation. Do you know what reconciliation means? It means to, to, to make every effort to return the relationship to how it was before the injustice or the grievance occurred. It's to make a concentrated effort to forget the grievance, to put it out of your mind, and to love them. And friends, that hurts. Forgiveness is being around that person that you don't like, even when you don't want to be around that person, and committing yourself to seeing them, not for what they did to you, but for what Christ did for them. Forgiveness is every time you're tempted to bring up what they did. Instead, you bite your tongue. It's not easy. It hurts. But that's real forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard, but, but friends, if you're a Christian, you have to do it. Why? Because you have been forgiven. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ. What? When Jesus gave his disciples his, his prayer, the perfect prayer, he said, forgive, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our... Friends, according to Jesus, our forgiveness from God is contingent on our forgiveness of others. That should be sobering for some of us. Because some of us have big books full of grievances and grudges we're still holding on to. Well, according to that scripture then, God's got a big book up in heaven that he's still got some grievances against you. According to, to his prayer, it says, as we forgive our debtors, simultaneously, God forgive us our debts. Not before, not after, as. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you will use, it will be measured back to you. Matthew 6, 14 through 15, for if you forgive others the trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now this isn't saying God's up in heaven and he's thinking, okay, Richie finally forgave that person, now I can forgive him for this. He's not up there trading forgiveness. That is not what these verses are saying. It's saying that only when you experience God's forgiveness can you adequately forgive others. And it's saying only when you start forgiving others will you appreciate God's forgiveness of you. Because when you really forgive, it hurts. And you realize when Jesus forgave you how much it hurt. You see, if you make people grovel and crawl in order to receive your forgiveness, it's because deep down, that's how you view God's forgiveness of you. Notice Matthew 18.35, it says, forgive from the heart. Verse 34 of chapter 12 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? See, the reason not much forgiveness is coming out of our mouths is because we don't have any forgiveness in our hearts. You cannot give out of a deficit. You cannot forgive out of a deficit. You're stingy with your forgiveness because your God is stingy. You halfway forgive because deep down you think God only halfway forgave you. And so how can we forgive? How is Joseph able to forgive his his lousy brothers? Well, when you examine the life of Joseph, you 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 keep running into the same statement. The Lord was with Joseph. You see, when he was thrown in the pit, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. In prison, the Lord was with Joseph. In Pharaoh's court, the Lord was with Joseph. Friends, you need to know today, I don't care where you're at, Jesus is with you. You see, rather than wasting time thinking about what he would do to his brothers, and I'm sure Joseph had plenty of years of thinking what he was going to do to Joseph, but then God got into his head, and instead of wasting time on that, Joseph got to know his God. Rather than allowing his misfortunes to ruin his life, he allowed God to use his misfortunes to transform and save lives. 
You see, friends, things are going to happen to you in your life that you are not responsible for. People are not going to treat you right. Bad things are going to happen to you. Young people, the world does not revolve around you. Bad stuff is going to happen. People in this world are mean. And they can do cruel, cruel things. There are things that are going to happen to you that you're not responsible for, but you are responsible in how you respond to those injustices. And either we can get on our pity pot and cry about how unfair life has been or how wrong that person was, or we can allow God to take our tragedies and transform them into victories. This is what's crazy about the story of Joseph. With every single injustice that happened to him, God was just moving him up in authority and influence. Every time he thought, God's taking me down, God was bringing him up. There are two groups of people in the world, friends. Those who've had bad stuff happen to them, and they never forgive anyone, therefore they never heal, and they become incredibly bitter, miserable people so God cannot use them. And then you have the second group, those who've had bad stuff happen to them, but they learn how to forgive, and therefore they heal, and God is able to use them in a mighty way. Joseph wasn't perfect, but he learned how to forgive. Joseph reconciles. He doesn't retaliate. When he is second only to Pharaoh, notice, he doesn't go after the cupbearer like I would have. He doesn't go after Potiphar like I would have. He doesn't go after Potiphar's wife. I'm going to get you back for what you did. No, he doesn't even go after those lousy brothers of his. How do you react when things don't go your way, when people don't treat you right? Do you reconcile or do you retaliate? You have heard that it was said. This is Jesus talking on the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, my kingdom is different than this world's. My, the way I do things is so different than this world. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be what? This is the key. Your sons and daughters of your father who is in heaven. You see, until we learn how to forgive, we cannot be children of God. Period. Until you learn how to forgive that member that you don't like or that neighbor that you got in a fight in 10 years ago, until you learn how to forgive yourself, you cannot be a child of God. And towards the end of the story, Joseph's brothers show up. He has to test them to see if he can trust them because you see, real forgiveness is not if you're being abused, you allow yourself to continue being abused. Forgiveness is not allowing yourself to continually be taken advantage of. Forgiveness does not make you a punching bag. Forgiveness does not make you the, the, the floor mat for people to wipe their feet off on. In this life, there are going to be people you can't trust, and yet we're still called to forgive them. We may have to love them from a distance because they may take advantage continually but we still are called to forgive them, to reconcile them to God. Joseph gives his brothers another chance to see whether they can be trusted. At the conclusion of the story, when a, when a famine covers the land, his family is in need, and they show up at his. How ironic. God has an amazing sense of humor. They show up at his door. They don't recognize him, but, but Joseph recognizes them. They're the ones who beat him up and threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery, and left him in prison to rot. And throughout this encounter, Joseph has to keep excusing himself from talking to them because the, the emotions are so high. He is so hurt. He has to hide his, white, his, his weeping from them. And that's because real forgiveness is hard. And in this final test to see if his brothers have changed, Joseph threatens to imprison the youngest, now Benjamin, the last son from Jacob's wife, so they think, Rachel. But in a total reversal of events, rather than condemning Benjamin as they had done to Joseph, what do they do? The ten brothers beg for Benjamin to be set free and for them to be imprisoned in his place. Notice what it says. 
Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried. Make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loud that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. You see, forgiveness is hard. It hurts. But I want to tell you, when you can start forgiving, that's when you will start healing. Not long after this moment, the truth The real moment of truth comes. Jacob, dad, dies. And the second dad dies, the brothers are worried again. Joseph will hate us. Joseph will hate us and he'll pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. You see, Joseph was in prison many years and in a pit, but so were the brothers. They've been imprisoned by what they did to their brother. They fall at his feet and they beg. Notice, they beg to become his servants. But instead of retaliating, Joseph begins reconciling. He says to them, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about at this day to save many people. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will will provide for you and your little ones and be comforted then. And he spoke kindly to them. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And friends, we need to understand something today that over 2,000 years ago when we did our worst to God, God gave us his best. Joseph was betrayed, but he ends up at the right hand of the king, and he uses his power to save instead of condemn his brothers. He restores his brothers rather than making them slaves. Joseph wasn't perfect, but you need to understand this Bible is about one person, Jesus Christ, and Joseph points us to one who was perfect. You see, Jesus was abandoned by his family. He was abandoned by his friends. He wasn't just beat up. He was nailed up to a tree, yet Jesus forgave his executioners. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Don't you see what we meant for evil? God meant for good. To save many people. And although we betrayed him, every single person in this room, now he is at the right hand of the Father. And instead of using his power to condemn us, he uses it to vindicate us. Instead of making us his slaves, the Bible says he calls us his brothers, his sisters. Of all the things I can be grateful for as a Christian, three words, I am forgiven. It's that instead of giving me what I deserve, instead of paying me back from all my sins, Jesus took my sins to the cross and he died in order to reconcile me to God. And according to to Paul, to the church at Corinth, that is what our primary ministry is. We are to be ambassadors for God. Reconciliation and forgiveness is supposed to come out of our lips, pointing people from us to God. Jesus took our sins to the cross. He died in order to reconcile us to God. So now, when all those sins should come back to bite me, Jesus, because He has covered me, there are no sins to be found. Hallelujah! I am forgiven. Let us pray. Father, we thank You and we praise You for the awesome God that You are. For all that You have done. And all that You are doing. We thank you for the beauty of reconciliation. That when you forgive us, you throw our sins into the depths of the sea and you forget about them. That when you forgive us of our sins, you you, you cover them with your son's blood. So now when people see us and should see our sins, they don't see it. They see Jesus. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that message. And now that I have been set free from my debts, 
May I start being an ambassador of Christ and start setting people free that I've held hostage for, for weeks, months, years. May I do what Joseph did and set family members and loved ones. May we set them free rather than using our position against them. May we use our position to elevate them. More than anything, Help us to be more like you. May we have the kind of love that even forgives his executioners. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.